and we are being recorded now. Hello, uh, thanks uh, for coming to the Jenkins Online Meetup. Uh, today we have a, a special guest, Mark Jackson. He will be presenting uh, the first uh, talk about the Jenkins on Kubernetes and he will show how to get started with it. Uh, if you have never participated in Jenkins Online Meetup, uh, it's an online platform we use in the Jenkins community. Uh, we have uh, several dozen meetups around the world, but we also try to organize online events, especially this month. And uh, for that, uh, we have a special meetup. Uh, this meetup is basically organized by contributors. So everybody there volunteers uh, their own time uh, and we try to do our best. Uh, we talk about developer tools, about uh, best practices, about using Jenkins everywhere. And the main objective is to show and tell. So we want to have so long presentations, we want to have uh, marketing features. Instead of that, we want to focus on real experience and we invite everyone to contribute by comments or by joining uh, next meetups. And again, the topic today is about Jenkins and uh, Kubernetes. I'm not sure how many of you already use Kubernetes, but it definitely gets more and more popular. And in the Jenkins project, of course, we want to ensure that uh, Jenkins runs uh, smoothly on uh, Kubernetes and uh, that uh, Jenkins is a part of Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, there is a lot of ongoing work, including roadmap, uh, where we want to include uh, more topics. And uh, uh, of course, we also want uh, to talk about uh, what happens and how to use uh, Jenkins on Kubernetes. So, uh, basically, if you're interested to talk about anything, uh, if you're interested to share your war stories, case studies, or show how to you automate uh, your flows with Jenkins and Kubernetes, uh, we are welcome uh, such discussions. I use uh, the automation work, uh, but it may also mean CI, CD, DevOps, whatever. Uh, Jenkins can help everywhere. And if you want to do some uh, uh, specific talks or if you want uh, to get more information, uh, um, uh, for example, for plugins, for count charts, for Jenkins Kubernetes operator, it's a separate project which is available or just for in about integration with different Kubernetes tools or cloud providers which use Kubernetes, please do so. For all these topics, uh, we are going uh, to have meetups. Uh, we are actually planning a series of these meetups. Uh, right now, there is around five and we are looking for more. So if you're interested to present your experience, um, please let us know. Uh, there is advocacy and fish uh, uh, Gitter channel um, and uh, there is also a Jenkins CI channel in the Kubernetes Slack. Uh, you can use uh, one of these channels uh, to contact us and we can talk about presentations. Uh, or if you want uh, to request uh, a particular topic, uh, we are also happy to help and uh, uh, to look together for options. That's it uh, from me. Uh, today we have uh, again uh, Marky who will present uh, uh, how to get started on Kubernetes. Uh, Marky is an active contributor in the Jenkins community. He's also a really active contributor in Kubernetes community. And of course, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have him at this meetup. Uh, uh, I believe Marky will present himself later. Uh, with more details. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, there is a Zoom chat. Uh, please ask questions there after the presentation and we will ask Mark these questions. Uh, and uh, if you want to ask anything offline, if you watch this video on YouTube, uh, also please use a Gitter channel or Kubernetes Lab. We will be monitoring all these uh, channels as well. Uh, that's it from me. And, yeah, Thanks a lot for bearing with me. And now, Mark, uh, the floor is yours. All right, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, I am going to start for anyone that, uh, give me just a second here. Hopefully, everybody can see the presentation. Uh, today we're going to be, <clears throat> be discussing Jenkins on Kubernetes. Uh, the way I do uh, my talks is I try to make them as fun as possible, mainly because I'm nervous and cracking a joke when you're nervous is always a good thing. Uh, so without further ado, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to me ramble. And uh, <clears throat> if you could just hold your questions till the end, I will do my best to answer the questions. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So for those that don't know me, my name is Marky Jackson. I'm a software engineer working on open source integrations with 
Encore. I am a Jenkins Core maintainer as well as a plugin maintainer for many plugins, uh, the Kubernetes plugin, the Prometheus plugin, and many more. I'm a Kubernetes org member. I work with the ContribX, and most recently I was made a release engineer associate. You can find me on GitHub at Marky Jackson Talia or on Twitter at Marky Jackson5. Also at LinkedIn, I'm not going to go ahead and read that all. Uh, for those that uh, don't know me, one of the things I'd like to make very known is I love to answer people's questions. Uh, it makes me feel good to help people. Uh, and just, you know, if you have a question that you don't want to ask here or don't feel comfortable asking in a public setting and you want to do it privately, my messages are open on Twitter and you're more than welcome to message me. I try not to do a lot of the help desk things. Uh, so, you know, I, ex I expect that everybody's done a level of research before you ask a question. But if you want to just chat and say hi, I'm a super friendly person. For those that do know me will say I'm a friendly person. So what are we going to talk about today? The presentation is going to cover a light, and I specify a very light overview of Kubernetes and the Kubernetes plugin. And the reason I say a very light, I won't be going into the real deep technical weeds of what Kubernetes is or what Jenkins is. Uh, I will cover how to set up and configure Jenkins on Kubernetes. I will show you how to use the Kubernetes plugin. I'll do a code walkthrough that'll show you some of the YAMLs that I will be using for this. I'll do a demo of that, and then we'll close up with some questions and answers. Uh, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started. What's Kubernetes? I, everybody knows what I would hope what Kubernetes is. It's a pretty hot topic uh, in the tech sectors. But Kubernetes, or as K8S as some people call it, it's a project that was spun out of Google. It was an open source next generation container scheduler that was designed with lessons learned from developing and managing a project internally at Google called Borg and Omega. And essentially what that does is it abstracts away the layers of hardware uh, uh, of the nodes and provides a uniform interface for application and scheduling of resources in a shared pool. Uh, why would you want to put Jenkins on Kubernetes or use some of the agent uh, ability for scalability in Kubernetes? Well, like I just said, scalability, containerization, and also infrastructure as code. One of the things that I didn't mention in here that's really critical to, to understand is when you think about Kubernetes and Jenkins, one of the ideas here is a cost saving. So doing, putting Jenkins in Kubernetes also is a benefit in a cost savings. So the Kubernetes plugin, I am one of the maintainers. Uh, the uh, gentleman named Carlos Sanchez wrote that plugin, which basically allows the running of dynamic agents in a Kubernetes cluster. And by doing that, what you do is you lower the cost of having to spin up uh, agents everywhere. It helps you with the ability to set that up as infrastructure as code. And then I've also included a link to where that uh, repo for that plugin is. I will also say that I won't go into the real deep technical ways that you can use this plugin. I will keep it at a very high level uh, just for running dynamic agents in Kubernetes. But there's all kinds of different ways that you have the ability to use the Kubernetes plugin, such as setting up pod YAML, uh, pod YAML templates uh, and all kinds of things. If you look at the readme on the plugin, there's all kinds of examples. So before we get into the demo, which is what the crux of this is going to be, I want to talk about some assumptions in this demo. Number one, in order to run this demo, you have to have a Kubernetes cluster. You have to have the kubectl, which is the command line interface that allows you to communicate with that Kubernetes cluster. You have to have the code. I've included a code repo here where I have made it public, the code that I will be using here. For this particular demo, I'm going to be using Minikube and it'll be running on the latest 1.18 version. You do have the ability to run this on any type of cluster. An example in the Kubernetes community, when we do a lot of our testing, we use Kind, which is Kubernetes and Docker. I've included, if you install the uh, Kind 
uh, platform, there's a command on how you can create a, a 1.18 cluster, and then you can run through this demo. So I am going to get started into the demo. I will go ahead and give me just a second as I move through some of these screens here. So I want to talk about, a, for, before we get into the code walkthrough, which is right here, I'd like to talk about a few things that uh, we'll be using in here. And, and I want to give them a little bit of attention before we start. The first thing is the Docker Hub. I've included uh, in my Docker repo the image that we'll be using for the deployment YAML. I'll also- Okay, um, here it starts. Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, just a second. Uh, I believe that I muted everyone else. But, yeah. Could we lock the meeting room? Mm. Yes, lock it, please. Yeah, yeah, that would be great if you could lock the meeting room. Okay, just a second. Okay, locked. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we'll be talking about is the Jenkins uh, image that we'll be using for our agents. Now, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this in depth because there's a lot of work that's going on around this. As you know, there has been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of commentary, a lot of pull requests in, in removing some of the terminology that's used in Jenkins. Uh, this is the repo that we'll be using for our template. I'd like to make a uh, note in this particular section. The terminology that was previously used is now been deprecated. The new terminology we're using is Okay, so yeah, that's why we shouldn't post meetings next time. Yes, we're getting Zoom bombed. I will have a lot of work to clean up this video. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, all. Uh, but yeah, you posted a Zoom link somewhere in public, and I guess we're getting it now. Okay. So one of the uh, one of the things that has been done here is changing of the terminology. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the uh, images that have been previously used have been deprecated in terms of naming and the new naming is now the inbound agent. Across the Jenkins e uh, ecosystem, there are, there's a lot of work that's also where people are changing the terminology. I'm really proud of the work that the entire community has done uh, around this. And uh, I've noticed it happening a lot in other open source projects. So one of the things that I will uh, strongly uh, ask people to do is when you're posting comments in, in chats, try to be mindful and empathetic of the language that you're using and the language that the Jenkins community is using. So with that, let's go ahead and get into a little bit of the code. I am going to share my editor, which is a little bit easier to do. Uh, the base image is a very simple image. Uh, this is not meant to be an image that you use in production. Uh, I've added some comments into the image here that things to be cleaned up. These would be great first issues that I'd love to help mentor people. If you wanted to get involved and try to understand something, I've created some comments in here uh, for cleaning some of this up. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the RBAC YAML. And the reason being is because I wanna talk about some of the pieces that are involved here. So we're doing three things in this chunk of code. Number one, we're creating a service account. Very, very simple. That service account is named Jenkins. The second thing we're doing is we're creating a cluster role. And in that cluster role, we're defining what resources we'd like this service account to have access to. And finally, we're saying uh, in the cluster role, finally, we're saying what verbs are allowed for the given resources. We then create a cluster role binding, which binds that service account to this cluster role. Now, the reason I wanted to spend some time in, in discussing this is because a lot of people may be confused about how RBAC is set up. So there's two types of RBAC. There is what you would call a role or a cluster role. 
When you define something at the cluster role, this is at the root level of the cluster. For development work, this may be good to do because it helps you get around things quicker. For production, it is not advised to set things at a cluster role. The second way you have to do that is to set a role and a role binding, which allow you to do something at the namespace level. But again, for this particular demo, I'm setting everything at a cluster role. We then have our service and there's our service. Our service is pretty straightforward. I will cover this one part and that is for this demo, I am using a node port. A node port is good for quick and easy development. A node port is not what you should use in production. So please note that this demo is for development only. You should not use this in production. Finally, we're covering the deployment. The deployment is a very straightforward piece of work here. It basically will call our image. It'll set some uh, Java ops arguments. And then we're gonna set a volume, which is locally an empty, uh, empty directory. Again, this is only for development. I would not use this in production. Yeah. Okay. So, Could you please increase the font size a bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see here. I can't increase the font size. If you can't see this in the recording, the, the code is available to walk through. And if you have any questions about it, uh, actually, let me bring it up this way. So is that a little bit better? Yeah, that's okay. great, Marky. Thank you. You're welcome. I apologize for the small text. So a very simple, straightforward deployment. I will stress that, the, again, this is only, I, I know you keep hearing me say this is only for development and not production. The reason that I'm saying that is there's a, sometimes a tendency to say, oh, this works great in, in my local testing. I'm just going to move this straight to, you know, production for my company. I've seen that happen. This is not the code you should be putting in production. So with that, I am going to get started. So I have a mini cube cluster that I've already launched. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get started. The first thing that I want to do is I want to just go ahead and create a namespace. And I want to call that namespace Jenkins. Oh. Yeah, again, it would be great to increase the font a bit. Uh, is that better? I don't see the text. Oh, let me just clear my screen and it should come back up to the. Is that bigger? Can everybody see that? It's fine. Awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a namespace and we're going to call that namespace Jenkins. The next thing that we want to do is we want to go ahead and deploy our RBAC configuration to the namespace that we created called Jenkins. And we'll see what this has done for us is it's created the service account. It's created our cluster role. And it's created our cluster role binding. The next thing we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and deploy our service. So we can see that the service was created. And finally, what we're going to do is we're going to create the deployment. Again, we're always doing this in the namespace. I'd like to make to point that out that it's always good to ensure that you use the namespace command. So you're by default, if you don't uh, use the namespace command, what this will do is it'll put it in the default namespace and you don't want your 
applications running in the default namespace. And we can see that that has been created. So let's go ahead and look at those pods get created. And the reason that I'm leaving this up on the screen is because I cannot go to the UI until I see that the pod has been created. And now we see that it's running. So we will go ahead and move over to the UI. Uh, missed one little piece here. One of the things that you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to get the Minikube IP. And this will tell you the IP that your local Minikube is running on. You'll need that to be able to get into the cluster. Uh, I actually missed another piece as well. I apologize. One of the things I showed you in that deployment was the, uh, we were using a node port. So what do you have to do here is you're going to need to get the actual node port. And you can do that by running a kubectl get service. It'll show you the Jenkins service that we created. The type is node port. And you'll see this actual node port. This is the port you will use to connect to your Jenkins instance. And just like that, we now have Jenkins running in Kubernetes. So we're gonna move to the next part of the demo. One of the things that I uh, wanted to show you in the code that we've created in the Docker file, I have already pre-installed some plugins. And one of those plugins you'll see I've installed is I've already installed the Kubernetes plugin. So we're gonna go ahead and get the Kubernetes plugin configured. Recently, that there was a change made to the plugin. It is no longer in the global configuration. So for this plugin, you'll come into the build executor status and you'll see cloud uh, configure cloud. This is where you will start that configuration. So we're gonna go ahead and add a new cloud, which will be Kubernetes. We're gonna configure this. The first thing that we need to do is we need to add the Kubernetes uh, URL. For the Kubernetes URL, we're going to go ahead and run a, a command, which is kubectl cluster dash info. We are going to grep for master. This will tell us the port that uh, the IP and port that the master is running on. Uh, and we're just going to drop that right there. And then we want to test the connection. We see that the connection is successful. The next thing we need to do is for the communication in the Kubernetes cluster to be able for the Jenkins control plane to connect to the Jenkins URL, we're gonna need to go ahead and get the actual IP of the pod that is running Jenkins. So that will just be a few commands. One, we're going to get the pod. We'll copy the pod name. we will describe the pod. And in here, you'll see there's the IP. So we will copy this IP going back. And 8080. So we're, uh, we're awesome there. We now have our Jenkins set to communicate with the, within the Kubernetes cluster. I'll just go ahead and apply that and we'll move to the next thing, which will be the, the uh, configuring a pod template. We'll add the pod template for this particular one. I am going to give it a name of inbound agent. We'll set up the def uh, the details. So we know we created this in a namespace called Jenkins. We're going to need to give the agent an actual uh, label. In this particular demo, we're just going to call this inbound agent. We need to create the container. So this is the part where I explained in the Jenkins Docker Hub, where we will be taking the inbound agent 
and that will be for we'll be using that image. So I'm going to go ahead and give this a name. We know that the Docker image is coming from Docker Hub and it's from Jenkins forward slash inbound agent. We're going to just do a little bit of configuration here to make sure we have some things set as we want them. So you have the ability with this uh, Kubernetes plugin to set request and limits. You can have liveliness probes. You can have this set to run as privilege mode or to run as a specific user. You also have a lot more flexibility. You can set the uh, YAML for the pod. Something that I'm going to go ahead and do is we know we created a service account called Jenkins. So I want to make sure that this runs with that service account. I finally want to just make sure that I set every agent to terminate and give me just a second, which is right here. And what this allows you to do is when the Kubernetes plugin launches an agent, you have the ability to say, keep that agent or to terminate the agent once the job is done. For cost savings, I want to make sure that I'm terminating these things so they're never running. And for that, we are done making our configuration. So I will go ahead and apply. I will save this and I'm going to go ahead and now build up a new job. So I'm going to do a, a very generic job here. I'm going to call this demo. I'm going to use a freestyle project. You do have the ability to use pipelines for this. For this particular demo, I am not going to use pipeline. For future demos, we do have some coming up uh, in May, one where I will be doing. And for subsequent demos, everything will be in a pipeline. For this demo, I just wanted to keep it as generic as possible. So we come in, the first thing that we're going to want to do is we want to make sure we're restricting where we actually have this job uh, labeled. And we know we created this called inbound agent. So we'll move there. And I'm just going to make a very basic job and I'm going to just say echo hello world. As soon as I can spell. And it's very straightforward. We will save this. I'm going to turn auto refresh on and I am going to build this job. The first thing you'll notice when I built this job that it's sitting and it's waiting. So let's come back here and let's watch that agent get created. So you can see we have now created the inbound agent. This is launched in Kubernetes in the same namespace. The pod is creating. We'll give that a few more minutes. We can now see that the pod is running. And if we go back to our job, we will see shortly that the job is now running. We can see it has run the hello world. It used a default YAML for the template. And we can see that the job was a success. Now, if we go back to our terminal, we can see that that same pod that was spun up for the job has now terminated. The beauty of that is, is you can now paralyze builds. You can save cost. So I'm going to go back to my slides because that sort of ends the demo. And so what did we learn here? Kubernetes allows for a robust way to provide Jenkins scalability. It allows the ability to run many more build plans in parallel. It also allows the ability to automatically replace or uh, replace corrupted Jenkins instances. 
and to spin up and remove agents based on need, which in turn saves cost. So that concludes the demo. I would like to move to the question and answer portion. I do know that there, I can, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see the chat because I do see a lot of notes in chat. Yeah, while uh, you were speaking, I was also capturing questions. Uh, so I will share Google Doc with everybody in the chat. Um, the way we have questions which haven't been answered. If it's more convenient for you, Marty. Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay. Mm. So if so, let's start from the beginning. Oh, it's ni so nice to see anonymous goose, uh, the Kubernetes uh, related meetup. Okay. <laughs> Who said that? They get a honk for that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, okay. So what's next uh, for meetups? It's a question I got in uh, private. Um, and yeah, I'll uh, briefly answer that if you don't mind, Mark. Yeah. So we plan a series of meetups. Right now we are talking with speakers. We have some uh, reviews. Uh, in general, we want to have one meetup maybe uh, every two weeks. We have one meetup uh, announced uh, for next Tuesday. It will be about um, uh, uh, with uh, configuration as code, with job DSL for jobs management, and with Helm 3, which was mentioned uh, in the chat uh, multiple times. Um, so stay tuned for the next meetups and uh, we will be increasing complexity. We will be doing deep dives during the next meetups. Uh, so there will be a lot of interesting content there, we hope. Okay. I would like to extend my apologies for the Zoom bombs there. Uh, I apologize deeply for that. For the video, we will edit that out. Again, my apologies to everybody for that. The world is an interesting place currently and you shouldn't have been subjected to that. Right, we've been using uh, Zoom for two years uh, or more, and uh, this is the first time we, when we actually got uh, Zoom bombed. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's go next to the questions. Uh, how is it different from Jenkins X? Uh, so this is, it's, this is, Jenkins X allows for a very GitOps nature. Uh, when I say GitOps, you can actually create your pipeline directly from a Git repo. Uh, this is more native, uh, very different. Uh, Jenkins X also offers the ability to spin up the cluster and in some ways that's that's a super awesome But this what I meant for this demo was to, to be a very native no no tools underlying other than really Minikube being used But you can do this with Jenkins X. There is that ability Hopefully that answers the individual's question Yeah, I would also like to it from administration and governance standpoint. So Jenkins X right now is a separate project. It has been built around Kubernetes ecosystem to do continuous delivery in Kubernetes environment. So he, uh, this project targets uh, this specific use case. Jenkins is a more generic automation server. It can do a lot of different things. Uh, and yeah, you can also uh, run it in Kubernetes. But the use cases at the moment are different. So you can probably also do continuous delivery with Jenkins and Kubernetes, uh, but at the same time, you will have to configure a lot on your own while Jenkins X provides many features out of the box. That's correct. The, okay. the purpose of this was to be more uh, native in our delivery of the underlying uh, platform, as well as the code that we were deploying. We didn't want to use any special tools to do that. Yeah, right. The next question is about um, uh, documentation. So will uh, these steps be documented somewhere? The, uh, so uh, unfortunately, I did not put these steps in the readme. However, I promise to have that out to you in the next 24 hours. The uh, repo will, readme will be updated with the steps for what I actually did. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marke, what do you define if I uh, hint uh, that roadmap for a second? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Okay, uh, so you may have noticed some conversations in the Jenkins community that we are actually working on the public roadmap for the project. So this roadmap is uh, it's just a draft. It lacks a lot of items and we will be putting more content specific for Kubernetes there. But one topic about the documentation, that uh, documentation is also on our roadmap. And right now we're in uh, the process of discussing items we would like to put there. 
and uh, no cheating. If you open the mailing list associated with uh, this thread, you can see that uh, there is a special uh, roadmap item uh, related to Jenkins and Kubernetes documentation, which would include a lot of solution pages, case studies, etc. Um, and we really intend to, to document that, and we invite uh, any one who is interested to contribute in this area and to improve Jenkins documentation for Kubernetes. Because yes, there is a lot of things to improve, and uh, it would be great uh, to do it together. Well, and and the, already on your screen highlights that Victor Farsich's DevOps Toolkit 2.4 book, which is Kubernetes and Jenkins, has been open sourced, right? So, so we've got we've got good resources to begin. Yep, and probably this is the only book in the world which has been supported by Helm charts. Unless I missed something. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's get yeah, a next question. Okay, yeah, let's go on. Uh, why did we choose a deployment instead of stateful set? Uh, that is a, That is an awesome question, uh, and and I would uh, super awesome question. So why did I choose a deployment? This was Minikube, and a deployment really works well with Minikube. Why would you use a stateful set if you're doing a production Jenkins deployment? you would want a staple set and not a deployment. So why did I choose a deployment? Because this was just Minikube based. If I, when we do future demos and I actually show spinning up a cloud environment with Kubernetes for Jenkins, I will not use a uh, deployment. I will use a staple set. I have the code available uh, already for that uh, particular demo where it will be a stateful set, an ingress controller, ingress object, and things of that nature. Very good question. But again, for development, I just chose to use a very simple uh, for Minikube deployment YAML. Thank you. Another question is about what will happen on pod respawn for a demo. Um, well, can you repeat that? What will happen on the pod respawn uh, for your demo and specifically what will happen with agents and how to manage agents in such case? So you'll notice when I did the configuration, I had the pod retention and I set that to terminate. So what that means is, is that the pod will be launched, the job will be run on that, and then it will terminate that. It will not respond. You do have the ability to say uh, in the pod retention configuration, that I'd like this pod to stay and not be terminated. And then you can run multiple jobs on there. But I felt that for the, for the demo purpose, having the pod go away once I was done served a, a more better purpose than leaving it there. But you do have that ability in the configuration. Thank you. And the next question is uh, Jenkins inbound agent tag and multiple question marks after that. Uh, can you repeat that again, Jenkins? Uh, Jenkins uh, inbound agent. Just a second, uh, I'll share my screen. So this one. So what does it actually mean? So the, the, what, what's highlighted on the screen here is the actual location of the Jenkins inbound agent. So what I'm using in my configuration is the location for that. I chose to name everything for the uh, name of the pod template as well as the label inbound agent just sort of keep everything unified. However, you can choose whatever you'd like. The only thing that you can't, you should not de delineate from is the image that you use for the pod template should come from the repo that is on the screen right here. And why is that? That has the JNLP remoting capability in there, which allows the agent to talk back to, the, uh, to Jenkins and you need that communication. Uh, so that's already built into this. That, that's why we use this image. Yeah, so if you're confused, uh, confused about the naming, actually it's a change which was delivered just in the beginning of this week. Uh, we are renaming uh, official images in order to clean up terminology. Uh, so yeah, this is the same official image as before, but um, uh, under the different name. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so the next question, uh, uh, so when starting free agent, it says that uh, there are zero of two uh, pods being created. Uh, so what does it mean and why there are two pods? So I create two pods just so I always have an auxiliary backup pod. 
if the first one should fail for whatever reason, even though logically it shouldn't because they're the same, you can configure that to just say one pod. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And um, thank you. Next question is, since we are giving authority to Jenkins to launch manage lead pods in the cluster, what steps are needed uh, to keep it secure? Ah, uh, very, very good question. So the first thing that you want to do is create a service account. Uh, as you'll notice, I created that service account. And then on the second part, I created uh, resources where I allowed what that service account can do. So for my demo, I, as I explained, I did everything at the cluster level role. If you want to be more secure, you should never do anything at the cluster level role. You should always do it at the namespace. That way it doesn't have the ability to affect any other namespace in that cluster. Uh, that's one piece of it. The second thing is having authentication uh, set. When you talk about RBAC, I created a service account and that's internal to the cluster. It's best to, if you're going to use internal authentication, that you separate everybody, every service account should be individual. And the, com the communication within that uh, RBAC for the, your, your cluster or your cluster role uh, should be specific that you know what it's doing. Finally, I'll say in terms of cluster management from a security standpoint, having auditing turned on on the AP Cube API, so you're able to see not only so you have your RBAC, you know what you're allowing people to do, but to also be able to log and monitor what people are doing. And to do that, you wanna have the uh, auditing turned on. And in future demos, I can show how to turn that on. It's really, really easy to do. And then you can use a whole different, a whole set of tools to be able to log the cube APIs to see what auditing, like to see what people are actually doing. Are they trying to create a namespace even though they don't have the ability? There's also other open source tools out there that will alert uh, on such things like that. Good uh, example is Falco is a, a tool that will alert uh, when you certain cube auditing has, has been hit. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are also some other questions about security. So if something uh, wasn't answered, uh, please follow up in the chat. Okay, and the last question we had uh, in the list before we go to the chat, if my pipeline triggers other jobs and the way it's till it finished, uh, that means uh, that uh, I will need two different pods. Uh, is it possible uh, to configure uh, uh, builds to use the same pod? Yes, so in that late, in the configuration of the pod template, you can specify yeah, I'm going to have sort of a uh, serialized, I, I'm going to daisy chain jobs together. And in my in my example, one of the questions was asked why would I use two pods as opposed to one. There's another good example of why you would use two pods, because you may want two jobs to run on two separate pods. So you do have the ability to do that. Great, thank you. So let's go to the chat questions. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so again, uh, restarting ports. Uh, what is your recommendation for management uh, the persistent for managing the persistent data on the master? Can the master uh, use replicas and use that data? For this particular example, I used an empty directory, which it's basically putting it in. You know, uh, I think I specified slash ten. So you have the ability to do that if you're using. Uh, a cloud, let's say you're, you're setting your Kubernetes cluster in a cloud infrastructure and you have Jenkins running in there, you're going to want to set that up. So say for AWS, you're going to want that on some a persistent volume and that persistent volume ties back to an EBS volume. And then their data is getting saved on the EBS volume. So for example, if your Jenkins, uh, I, I don't call it a master, I call it a control plane. So if your Jenkins control plane goes down and then if you're using a stateful set, it spawns another instance the configuration is already there and then it'll automatically create that that persistent volume claim which is tied to for aws the same is true in uh google uh it will automatically bind that persistent volume claim back with the pod from the stateful set and then will automatically connect it to your back end volume which in aws it's be an ebs mm -hmm. thank you 
And if you need to share your screen uh, to show uh, how it works, please don't hesitate to do that. Okay, uh, is it possible to specify a max number of ports uh, or is it unbounded? You can set the max number that you'd like. You can be as many as one, you can do as, as minimum as one, or you can set, I only want 50 pods. Uh, I've worked in some organizations where we have jobs that will spawn uh, many, many more jobs. And uh, with that, I think at one particular time, we had one that would spawn something like 400 different jobs. And we have that ability using the Kubernetes plugin. Crazy, but it, it, it's available. One of the things that you have to be, you have to be mindful of uh, when you're spawning agents in Kubernetes, you have to make sure that you're not taxing the cluster. What do I mean by that? If you only have so much memory and CPU on that cluster, but you're, you know, you're spawning, you know, 15 parallel jobs that are running some machine learning pipeline, that's, it's, you could bring down the cluster. So it really, it, it really benefits you to understand what you're trying to do in terms of the overall cluster. So with that, I think it's always good to have requests and limits. And I would also strongly suggest that anybody that's doing this and thinking about doing it in production, I would think about not only a namespace level request and limits, but setting a cluster wide request and limits. That way you know that if somebody's using a namespace and they're spawning an ungood, like a massive amount, they're not gonna bring the whole cluster down. And a lot of these are best practices. And, and if you've not done it in production, it may seem sort of weird. If you ever have questions, I love, I could talk about this all day long. So please, it, I'm a very collaborative person. Don't feel that you can't ping me. Yeah, there are chats where you can reach out to Mark right after the talk. So uh, Jenkins Gitter or Kubernetes Slack for Jenkins, uh, both channels. Yeah, I believe Mark is everywhere in any channel you have in Jenkins. Okay, next question. If you would like to offer uh, to developers the freedom to choose the image to be used uh, uh, to run their pipelines, let's say Python 3, uh, what is, uh, so then there is no other way uh, than uh, to build your own image on the top of the Jenkins agent. Is it right or other, other ways? So I wanna be careful when I answer this question because I'm one of those people that likes to tinker with things uh, I will say the ability is there to do it. Yes, you can. Uh, should you do that for production? No, don't do that for production. Mm -hmm. If you want to try starting off with dev, uh, a dev, a dev environment and making sure that you've ironed out every problem, uh, I would start there. Why am I so hesitant to say, yeah, go ahead, just do it? Because the, the inbound agent Docker image has been tested with Jenkins connectivity in mind. So that's all it, it worries about. When you start to try to do something different in there, the ability to go, I call it going south or go astray is, is high. And you may not get the same level of support if you were just using the base image from the open source community. Yeah. But it's definitely, it, it, I don't wanna discourage anybody from trying it because I will say I do it all the time. But if you're not, but I also know a lot of the underlying code so I can trace a bug faster. Yeah, one thing which was mentioned, if you don't want uh, to extend the uh, Jenkins official images on your own, there is also a repository Jenkins uh, slash JNLP agents. And there is a number of images inside. And one of the image, since we were talking about Python, so here's the image for Python 3 and Python 2. And uh, you can see that uh, this image is, well, we will need to clean up the naming, but it's actually based on the official inbound agent and it just installs additional tools. And, and that work is in flight. That work is in flight. Yeah, we will clean it up. Uh, but uh, yeah, some images are already available. And if there are common use cases, we could provide official images in the community for that. And if not, you can easily extend them because it's quite easy to do in Docker. Am I still screen sharing? 
Yes. Oh, okay, because, uh, okay. Uh, Zoom was saying then, I'm not and I was surprised. Okay. Mm. So, yeah, then uh, the next question. We want to migrate our uh, visual mesh uh, Jenkins data to continuarize the Jenkins uh, control point in Kubernetes, uh, but we are facing some issues with when mounting the volume with uh, the data on the Jenkins home. Any advice how to do that? Carefully. <laughs> uh, so when you do the migration, what I would strongly suggest doing is what I've done in other companies is I write a script to do the migration. I don't manually do it, especially when it comes to, I've dealt with a lot of doing EBS volume migrations, and that can be super, super complex. It's best to, to control it with a script. What, uh, how would you do that script? I have found personally that if I write it in Python, especially using AWS, I can use the Boto3 library. It, it makes it more seamless. Uh, your flexibility is there. It is doable. I would strongly suggest writing a script to do it. Okay, thank you. So we have something like four or five questions left. I think I suggest we go through them. We still have yeah. enough time. So can we have performance problem to have the master in a Docker? You can, yes. Uh, depending on how the, the control plane is configured, uh, one of the things that I would strongly suggest doing is if you're going to move Jenkins into Kubernetes, uh, that A, you know exactly what your request and limits are going to be on Jenkins, uh, on Kubernetes. So understanding what the jobs are that you're going to run, how you, you really have to start doing a tree of decisions on how you set your request and limits up but I have seen it become a problem. The problem has been rectified by setting good request and limits. Thank you. And the next question, uh, how do you manage uh, Jenkins backups and logs? When you're oh, that's a great question. And it's one that a lot of people uh, struggle with. Uh, so I will tell you the different ways that I've done it production wise. Uh, I've I used three different ways. The first way would be having a general sort of script and the script will just go in a, you know, copy up a full directory, tar it up and put it somewhere. That's one way to do it. The second way to do it is there's a lot of uh, plugins that you can use. One of the most widely used plugins is a plugin called Thin Backup. And then, so Thin Backup gives you the ability to set a cron-like schedule and control what you want to back up. You may just want to back up your jobs directory. Uh, you may just want to back up uh, your jobs directory and your credentials file. Uh, you may want to back up the whole ball of you know, the whole thing. And that, uh, that you have that flexibility to use the thin backup. I have used the thin backup, especially in conjunctions with S3. So you can write a script that will, you know, the, the job runs on thin backup. You'll have a script that will go Grab that, what, so how does thin backup work? Let me take a step back. Thin backup will go based off of your configuration and your schedule and will grab everything and zip it up. Once it's uh, done with the zipping, it will actually then after a certain amount of time will tar it up and make it an archive. You can then clean that up. So what I have done in the past is I had a, uh, I had a script that will go through, it knew the schedule to run, so if I said, I'm gonna take a backup every day at 1 a.m., it knew I'm gonna run every day at 1.15 a.m. I'll take that zipped file, I'll tar it, and I'll put it in S3, and then I'll send out an email saying, your backup was successful. If the job fails for some reason, I had a way that it would notify me, hey, your backup failed. And then you know we could then have the ops team go look and say, hey, why did this fail? There is a third way. The third way is using, uh, there is a, if you, especially if you're in Kubernetes, again, these are all open source tools that you can use, but if you wanted to back up your uh, Kubernetes, you, there's a tool out there called Valero, and Valero will allow you to back up full namespace items. That includes EBS volumes, let's say if you're using AWS. So uh, that's a cool tool. Yep, there you go, Valero backup. 
Uh, this was a tool, I forget who put this tool out originally. I wanna say it was Heptio, but I always mess that up. But uh, I use this. I can tell you that one of my good friends, Seth, he uses this. He's the one that turned me on to it. Super awesome tool. Uh, and this, you know, when you start thinking about Kubernetes, uh, now you have that ability. Thank you. Okay, so there is a lot of positive feedback coming in and we still have uh, several minutes uh, to close the questions. So yeah. the next one is about uh, running in AKS um, and using uh, volumes there. So when uh, a volume is... Uh, um, okay, so I must have the question. So when a storage claim uh, is created uh, towards my Azure uh, vendor, uh, how do I track uh, the file system and its usage? Uh, so let's, let me see if I understand. I missed under the bottom, but I raised YAMLs in my AKS cluster. It means it created a storage claim towards that. Uh, okay, so one of the things that I would suggest not doing is using this demo for a cloud. Uh, because this is more meant for local device, local development. It's not meant to use what you're, uh, what you're referring to, Mir, I believe, is it's called a volume claim template. Uh, I, what I, I have code and I was going to save it for another presentation, but essentially what happens is, is one of the earlier questions is why did you use a deployment over a stateful set? In a stateful set, when I would build something in a cloud, the stateful set gives me the ability to use something called a volume claim template. And what the volume claim template will now do is what you're saying, Mir, it will now track your file system. And then when that pod goes away, let's say your, your control plane for Jenkins goes away and respawns, now it knows that when that stateful set is tied to a volume claim template, it will know to automatically go find the last volume claim template it knows it had and reconnect. Now, if you delete the volume claim template, well, then you've got a lot more bigger problems. But to answer your question, Mir, what you want to use is, as a, for that type of a deployment, is a stateful set that has a volume claim template uh, set up with that. I, I'll tr I don't want to put the code out there yet because I feel giving the code without explanation will create more questions than I think should, you know, it would be fair to the person wanting to use it. I will say that in a, a very soon presentation coming up, I will be doing this very same demo, but on a cloud infrastructure that will use a stateful set with a volume claim template. And, and Mary, if you want to ping me offline, I can help walk you through setting that up. I'd be more than happy to do that to get you sort of moving in the right direction. Okay, thank you. And I guess the last question is about agents again. Isn't it uh, better to just add another container to the pod is, instead of customizing uh, the inbound agent image? I think what you're referring to, Boris, is sort of like a sidecar. You can do that. Uh, personally, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. One of the things that I'll say that may create complexity is now you have to track how that sidecar is going to communicate all the permissions through that. It also becomes an attack vector. So if you have that sidecar running and it has certain level privileges, that could be a problem. You've now allowed that. Uh, in a production level environment, I would say that sidecars are extremely beneficial if they are built in such a way that security was in the forefront of your design. And oftentimes that's not the case. Hopefully that answered your question, Boris. Yeah, thanks for this answer. Uh, so yeah, there is a lot of other comments. Uh, do you want to take one more question, Martin? Yeah, we could take, we could take, we could take a few more. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Tommy, I, Tommy, Hold on, I saw you turn your camera on and I, I wanna answer your question, but I just wanna to get to one person's before yours and I'm just trying to find it. Uh, Bala asked, is there a way to recover a deleted job in Jenkins? Uh, so the beauty uh, of, of recovering a deleted job is that config.xml, uh, if you still have 
the volume available, you then have the ability to recover that deleted job. Uh, it would mean that you would need to do sort of a restore uh, there. And, and I've seen various ways to do this, but one of the most easiest ways to do it would say uh, my EBS volume, it has my jobs directory, which has the config.xml, even the next build number and all of that things. All you would need to do is, is a, a, there's a, a kubectl command that'll allow you to copy over. You can do it that way. Uh, you can also, if you have a backup, you can restore it from a backup. So hopefully that answered there. It is possible, uh, Bala. Uh, let me, tell me you're next. I wanna just read your question. Uh, your question was, will this be published? Is that right? Yep, okay. Yes, this will be published. Obviously we have to go through and do some clever editing because we got Zoom bombed. Uh, but yes, this will be published to the Jenkins YouTube. Uh, I think we do, I think we have a jam playlist, but if you go to YouTube, you look up Jenkins, you'll see a chan, uh, a, a actual subscription, an actual link to the Jenkins, uh, that'll have a playlist that you can, you can subscribe to. And this will be there. It'll probably, I would say, give me at least 24 hours um, between Oleg and I, we're going to have to do some clever editing, but it will be published definitely by the end of the weekend yeah so yeah you can uh, see my terrible video choices right now uh, but uh, yeah what i wanted to show you there is official channel and uh, there is a lot of playlists where you publish actually everything so not only online meetups we also have a uh, special interest group for meetings and other topics so if you want to participate in a wider community and see what happens to see some demos or work and progress stuff you can go here and here's Jenkins uh, online meetup playlist, and be sure we will uh, get it posted soon. Mm -hmm. I think we've gotten everyone's questions. Before uh, before you close it out, Oleg, I want to thank everybody that uh, joined this. It, it's uh, for like I said in the beginning of my introduction, I am a super collaborative person. I love to help people because I feel that I don't know everything. And there may be a different way to do things. And when two people or a group of people are collaborating on something and everybody's learning and there's no, you don't feel like, oh, I'm not that smart. Or, I, I don't believe in that. When people learn together, it's an awesome feeling. Like I'm getting goosebumps right now, but it's an awesome thing to be able to learn together. And in a way that we're, we're empathetic to each other and we're just being friendly and human to each other. In this day and age, we need that more than ever. So please don't hesitate to ping me, to say hi to me. If we, when conferences start again, if you ever see me come up, uh, I'm a very approachable person. I will say I'm super identifiable because I'm the only guy that's tattooed all over the place. So don't think I, I'm scary or I'm, please talk to me, message me. I love to hear from people. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank uh, you for allowing me into your homes, living rooms, offices, whatever. That's just a beautiful thing. And I can thank you guys enough and girls and everybody. I don't mean to thank you. Thank you to Marke. Okay. Cheers, everybody. Be safe out there. Be, be happy. Love mm -hmm. your neighbors. Yep. Thank you. So just uh, to whomever is interested to see more content about Jenkins and Kubernetes, the next meetup is actually next Tuesday, 4 p.m. UTC. And we will have Nikolai who will talk about uh, uh, running uh, Jenkins fully configured as code with JobSL, JCask, and Helm 3. And you are more than welcome to join this session. So looking forward to meet you there. Yeah. Thanks all. I will stop the recording. I finally find this button.